play a rather quick and final uh, presentation. We're running way behind schedule, but uh, hopefully you guys can bear with us. We're uh, just about to wrap up our final slide, uh, slide deck of the night. And this is from our event sponsor, Qualcomm. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Lynn Heimblatt, our uh, you know, sponsor of VP of Technology at Qualcomm, had to leave uh, last minute with any emergency. But uh, fortunately, we have Carlos, uh, who is in Lynn's team, uh, she's one of the principal engineers uh, working on uh, sensor system integration. So uh, we're, we're going to welcome uh, Carlos here to the stage. Take it away, please. Talk about that sensor thing. Thank you, Chris. And welcome to Qualcomm. If you haven't been at the facility before, I can tell you it's an absolutely great place to work and to be. I want to talk about something completely different from anything you've heard. How to take this incredible amount of sensor creativity that you've seen, and you've only heard about the tip of the iceberg, and put it into a phone in a way that an app developer or an end user can make something wonderful out of it. It's a big job to <coughs> touch a little bit, but I'm going to end with a proposal that will help all of us, sensor builders, app developers, and mobile uh, device vendors, have a future life. Very briefly, I'm not going to spend too much time on corporate. Qualcomm <laughs> is the largest wireless device production company. It is a fabulous company. Okay. We also do RFICs. Actually, I've heard just to talk a little louder. We also do RFICs, and we are the ninth largest uh, semiconductor company worldwide. The group that I'm in is based in Santa Clara. Hopper Group is here, Hopper Group is in San Diego. We do not design or do anything to build sensors. We take the sensors that all of these wonderful <coughs> manufacturers provide and integrate them into a reference design. So we do hardware, we do chip architecture, we do software. <laughs> we do grouping microphones. <laughs> all right, stay with me, guys. We don't have a lot more minutes. And we do algorithms to put all of them together so that app developers and others can make something out of it. So you start with an accelerometer and you say, okay, I want to count steps. How in the world do you go from a raw accelerometer to a step counter? Not all that hard, but you need everything in between in order to make it happen. We have two members of our sensor team here for Ethan Production, Disha Abuya and Lawrence Howell. They're going to be running a little demo back there behind the coffee, which shows you how we use inertial sensors tightly integrated with video and camera to produce a great experience. This is different from the other demos you've seen. So, so far, when you look at systems integration, you've heard about the first two pieces. You've heard about sensor types, and there are more. And you've heard a little bit about sensors' characteristics, you've heard about looks, you've heard about sensitivity. But you haven't heard anything about high-level operating system requirements, third-party software libraries. These are people who make libraries to use sensors in a way. They don't manufacture sensors, but they're, they're sensor enhancers. You haven't heard anything about algorithm tuning. Okay, so you have an app, you've got 10,000 different sensor types, not quite, maybe 15. How do you know that your app is going to work over those 15 sensor types? You don't. That's called tuning. Calibration. Sensors are not perfect. If you look at the Android API, it says linear acceleration. Okay, so high school physics. I can take that and integrate it. I will know how to go from A to B and what the distance is. No way. Because of sensor errors. They're imperfect. And finally, if you ever try to lay out a board with a magnetometer, you know that you have to be extraordinarily careful where you put that e-compass. Because if it gets wrong, if it gets too close to the wrong kind of metal, you're going to have a big, <coughs> deviated compass reading. You've heard a lot on this slide. You've heard the sensors on one side, and you've heard a certain amount of applications on the right. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about it. Um, just. Notice that down there is multimedia video camera audio here at the bottom. That's what we're showing is video and camera in this regard. 
we are squeezed by a series of market trends. Time to market, fast, fast, fast. Lower power. I kid you not, people say, how much power can we spend? 10 microamps. For what? For the whole thing? Well, 100 microamps for the whole thing. Sub-milliamp power requirements, 24-7 operation. We have hundreds <coughs> of new Android and Windows handsets coming out every year, and it seems that there are more and more along the way. We have sensor requirements for navigation and augmented reality that require the kind of precision that you would normally expect from military sensor sets coming out of a 50 cent part. How do we do that? And finally, as you heard earlier, we want to put as many different sensors in a package as you can. Well, every time that you upgrade, becomes a different integration challenge. This is not meant to be a product line for these manufacturers. I just want to show you the list of manufacturers. It's a partial list of sensor vendors that we deal with on a regular basis to some extent or another. And the dots represent <coughs> the request from OEMs. So you notice that some of the folks here have bigger product lines. But I just want to show you, if you count the number, we are dealing with more than 18 sensor vendors, quite a bit more. And we're dealing with 26 sensor product lines. Now I'm talking about a device line. I'm talking about a line of models from that vendor. OEMs, Android, Windows, at least 16 that we're dealing with, you know, ultimately hundreds if you count the small ones. Every one of them wants a unique product. Every one of them wants to characterize what they have in a way that differentiates them from others. They want to use sensors that way. We at least have only two HLOS vendors we're dealing with. Ooh, isn't that nice? However, we have releases coming once or twice a year. We have new sensor types, humidity, added recently in Android 4.0. We have virtual sensors, which are combinations of sensors, various inertial sensors that create something like orientation, like heading, so that you don't have to worry about the algorithms. Every time there's a release, the sensor API is there. There's deprecated APIs, there's new APIs. If you are an Android developer, and you've been there, and you look at the Android Sensors Manager reference, you are reading tea leaves. What does it mean? They have little axis diagrams and they show you which way things are pointed. The only way that I've been able to find out what it really means is to reverse engineer it by trial and error until I find a set of formulas <coughs> that is consistent with what's there. I bleed for all of the apps developers who are trying to develop a cool UI and have to worry about all of this. <laughs> So sensors requirements, sometimes very, very strict. You have to have a particular range of flux measurement for your ALS. Other times, extremely big. What's the performance requirement in angular accuracy for the orientation sensor at end? I don't know. And we're trying to build a device that meets requirements, very poorly defined. <coughs> Somebody mentioned software, a big portion of it. You have drivers. You have factory calibration tools. You have sensor calibration libraries that help you get rid of those errors. You have sensor fusion libraries. Some of them were mentioned tonight. There's one in the back from Sensor Platform Sync. There are others that we deal with. And you have sensors features, which are ways of using the sensors that people have come up with in order to make it easier to do cool interfaces. Algorithm tuning is where you take your app algorithm and make it work with a particular handset and a particular sensor. We recently did a certain gesture, and I'm not going to say what it is, but it turned out that it was quite sensitive to the placement of the accelerometer on the phone, over which we have zero control. That was a tough one. This I worked on that. She knows all about it. So where am I with all of this? Look at this, 14 plus sensor types, accelerometer, magnetometer, gyroscope, ambient light, proximity, RGB, UV, AR, <coughs> on and on and on, capacitive, multiple types of capacitive sensors, not just one. 
lot more than 18 cents for vendors and more coming. And each of them is trying to be as creative as possible and we really are in the business of taking that creativity and delivering it to the OEMs. Who knows how many sensor product lines we have to do. Third party software libraries, I counted kind of on my hand. I said I know of five major ones that I'm dealing with right now. I'm sure that there are dozens out there that I don't know about, that I haven't come across, but I will at some point. And we have two HLOS requirement sets. However, that's not true. We have one for each road, <coughs> each release. Algorithm tuning, sensor mechanical device placement and sensor calibration. How in the world is an app developer who is not a physicist develop a sensors enabled app that runs on multiple phones, uses all of the creativity of the sensors vendors, and delivers a maximum user experience? That's the problem I face with it. I do algorithms for people who do software uh, Rashi was sitting in the audience as uh, our architecture for the chip. So it's an amazing challenge, and yet if we don't as an industry do something to cooperate in some simple way without squelching innovation, this is where the balance has to be, right? Proposing that there be enough commonality that we can break things up and that an app developer is guaranteed a certain uniform experience to begin with. And that when we have creative people who invent new features, that they can get those features out for the app developers to do. Right now there is a huge firewall between the stuff that happens in the software libraries and what the HLOS API will allow you to export to an app developer. There are many features from the sensors vendors, from the library developers, from us, that we would love to have the developers show and we say, okay, we need you to have a proprietary interface that gets around this way, whatever, and they just say, no thank you, no proprietary interfaces. We want to be able to upgrade our app and we want a standard interface that we know has some legs. How do we solve this? There's one solution that you know about. It's called Apple. One HLOS, few models a year, very few sensors. If you're lucky to have gotten in, you're making oodles of money. If you're not lucky to have gotten in, you wish to work. Right? Extreme type control or user interfaces, algorithms, quality control, factory <coughs> preparation, everything. It works. We know it works. For the rest of us for the rest of us. Standardization. And I say, a balanced standardization. One that allows this creativity to go forward. And at the same time, allows us to be seen. I want to bring up a reference design where very quickly I can bring up the library and the drivers and whatever and do a sanity test that says, yes, I can pull out basic raw sensor readings out of this, and it works. And I can support basic functionality. And I can say, okay, go test the design in the factory. Or there's a bug and I know how to fix it. Right now, I don't know that. I don't know if I have an integration problem, a software library bug, a hardware wiring bug. So we spend weeks and weeks and weeks <coughs> trying to figure out all of these hundreds of combinations of which particular junction was the one that failed. Please help. What can you standardize? For each sensor type, we could agree on some data sheet parameters that are standard and measured in the same way so that when you go to tune the algorithm, you know what it means. And you can believe it. If you have a motion library API, find a way to export the standard APIs and at the same time shine with your creativity. Let it run. Allow sensor self-test and reporting so that we can bring it up and say, okay, it's running. And you know, there are different axis configurations. We set up a phone, algorithms don't work. Okay, the x-axis is split backwards and the gyro is mounted this way and x becomes y. It would be nice to be very quickly able to tell that somebody set up the axes correctly so that at least we know which way is up. <laughs> what 
more can I say? It's your job. I inspire you to take this on for the benefit of our industry, for the benefit of the sensor business <coughs> right here, for the sanity of the people at Qualcomm and all of the other manufacturers, <laughs> and for the good of all these fantastic app developers who are sitting in the audience. Questions? We would prefer, as Qualcomm, to stay informal. I, if you have participated in an IEEE standards process, it takes a long time. I can't wait that long. I'm looking for something smaller, more informal, and industry cooperation that would get the results sooner than that. But we have not proposed that. This is our first invitation at this board for this kind of activity. <coughs> to follow on that question, do you... Uh, to follow that question, are you planning to try and spur standardization in some form or another? Yes, it probably would be Len. Uh, unfortunately, couldn't be here, but he is a VP in charge of uh, sensors and is very often in charge of our industry relationships. So, absolutely yes. If he were here, he could tell you more about what his intentions are. Have, One more. Have you uh, thought about using the Mythia lock? Yes, we're members, and that's one possibility. Yes. Okay, Chris. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. So, wow, that was a long ride, wasn't it? Uh, but uh, it's really a worthwhile ride. I uh, hope uh, you guys have all enjoyed uh, listening in to presentations, including the policies, a nice way of uh, wrapping everything up. Before we go over to our uh, wrap-up of the night, I would like to leave you guys with uh, a few you know, uh, final thoughts, uh, some takeaways, if you will, uh, from tonight. Uh, and uh, we're going to show you some, uh, some taste of what's ahead. Despite all the you know, system integration challenges and uh, standardization back there without issues, uh, we have some innovating minds uh, in this room that is making the future of sensor fusion reality happen. And I'm going to uh, share with you, as, as we part ways here, uh, to bring everything together here and uh, take a look at a, a broader uh, landscape of where the sensors are across <coughs> these major uh, platforms that the uh, colleagues have talked about today in terms of uh, however imperfect it may be, uh, there are some positive, you know, encouraging uh, signs here in the industry where uh, you can see across these three main platforms, Android versus Windows versus iOS, that uh, you, know, you can see the Android evolution from, you know, 2.2 Froyo to uh, gingerbread to I think sandwich uh, from May 10 to within the matter of uh, in a year and a half, that uh, these sensors were all you know, kind of enabled uh, uh, as we proceed forward at the current time. And these uh, sensor types up here, the four of them that are grabbed in uh, purple here, are also available as software sensors, as uh, you know, Carlos mentioned earlier. Not physical sensors uh, like these down here that we talked about tonight. Uh, iOS versus Windows Phone versus Android, if you look at the latest uh, releases, October-ish timeframe, uh, it will be iOS 5, Windows Mango 7.5, and Android Ice Cream Sandwich. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that Android does have kind of the uh, front, you know, uh, leading advantage over these other platforms. So that these other platforms are very quickly, uh, you know, catching up in terms of sensor enablement uh, in the native OS uh, support, API support-wise. Uh, the old, uh, main differentiation here is that, as uh, Michael Parse, you know, pointed out from uh, you know, since they're on today, uh, ambient temperature and humidity sensors, uh, they're the first to, you know, get implemented natively in, uh, you know, Android. Uh, these other platforms all do support these uh, mainstream sensors like the stimuli sensors, but they're just not yet natively supported in the operating system itself. Uh, next is, I'm going to, uh, you know, kind of leave you guys again with uh, these key use cases that uh, these leading you know, uh, innovators in the app 
and software and as a services community has been able to take and run with, uh, despite the imperfections uh, that we have in, in industry and sensors. Uh, Motion Fusion's, you know, teapot example that the wind gave to touch the spotter, uh, you know, uh, touch UI that uh, uh, you know uh, John, uh, John gave to color sensing that Jeff Singh gave today, and then all almost ahead in the, in the, in the future temperature humidity sensor apps that uh, Michael uh, demonstrated. All the flavors of what's ahead in the future, immediate future, and today. Indoor navigation positioning platform from uh, our you know, uh, partners on NNI uh, back there, which everyone uh, probably have already seen. It has motion sensor fusion games uh, by uh, companies like sensor platforms uh, that provide these uh, standardized APIs, which you know attempt to kind of try to solve those uh, standardization issues uh, in the meantime. Uh, there's motion touch micro apps, very unique wearable device-based uh, applications that the uh, Labs demonstrated for us tonight. There's a bunch of these sensor apps that are running on Android that tonight are sponsored by Samsung uh, that you probably have seen. A uh, remote control app that uh, some of you haven't seen, uh, they're available in the back, uh, demonstrating now. Sensor music player to various different uh, picture sizing apps that use uniquely these uh, optical sensors and motion sensors fused together to various different uh, games that are using uh, a variety of different combination of touch and motion in, in, in each of these uh, game scripts. Now, uh, one last part here, as so I think some of our presenters have touched upon, the, the true beauty behind the future uh, when it comes to utilizing sensors in a very differentiated user experience way is what we call all use of the uh, hearing. Uh, these past couple of years, sent a context-aware uh, it, uh, it means, it's a short term, but it means a lot. Uh, how we can very smartly, you know, sense users' contextual behavior and uh, what the user wants ahead uh, without really, you know, uh, interjecting, uh, you know, the phone you, the user interface experience. That's all you know, enabled by, in our minds, the sensors, how you uniquely use the sensors. And I, I would like to, uh, you know, at this stage, uh, take five minutes to really show you, for those of you who haven't seen this uh, case of the future, a company called Innovative User Experiences that are enabled by these multiple sensor fusions, a company called Alohar Mobile, uh, who's going to shortly show uh, you know, a brief taste of what, what that means. And that, that actually means you know, the sensor fusion actually is the key to making that uh, context where a uh, user experience really happen. And uh, in each of these devices that we've seen tonight, there's very different flavors of sensors, right? Uh, and these, uh, if you think of this as one master device, there are, uh, you know, multiple of these sensors being kind of uh, calculated and, you know, uh, threaded together, if you will, to make sense of some certain set of contexts. And uh, we're all, you know, trying to come up with a nice way to wrap everything up, uh, around a set of sensor fusion APIs. And these applications that sit on top of it somehow very uniquely uses these APIs to provision these contexts as a service is over to the, you know, over to each user of these each device. Now, if you, we've been talking about this all along tonight, but if you take this forward, what is, what does it really mean going forward? What does contextual awareness really mean? It really means taking these multiple, each of these device experiences and multiplying that by hundreds of millions of units across all these devices. And once you start thinking about uh, provisioning a very unique set of services around mobile sensory data cloud uh, that you collect very smartly these sensory data uh, points into the cloud and you know, start uh, you know, uh, putting together a very robust set of data analytics across these millions of devices that run these sensor fusion algorithms, you create a, uh, in essence, a, uh, a, you know, a gateway to uh, really provisioning a robust set of context-aware services to all of these separate web developers even, uh, not only mobile developers, to enterprises and service providers that take this rich, uh, mobile sensory data information and uh, really uh, service each of these individual users in a very contextual, uh, contextually smart way. Uh, and uh, with that, and it, uh, it has to be a very far efficient uh, in terms of uh, how you build uh, these you know, algorithms and how you make this whole end-to-end experience happen. 
So with that, I would like to uh, just bring on stage for, real quick a company that I just mentioned earlier called uh, Aloha Mobile, who is cracking this nut uh, of the future of context awareness. 